is now with great pleasure that I hand you over to our chair for this evening, Demiola Paccio. Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to our invited guests and colleagues from Imona and Cable campuses. I am Demiola Pacheco, Public Relations Officer of the Pathology Club of UE. I would like to thank you for joining us for what is to be our 13th installment of the Caribbean Pathology and Laboratory Medicine Student Initiative, CPAMZ. Today, I have been given the honor of introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Nadia Sant, who would be sharing a very informative presentation on medical microbiology. But before this, I would like to give a brief introduction to the outstanding contributions that Dr. Sant has made in the field of microbiology. Dr. Sant obtained her Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry at the University of Ottawa in 2004 and completed her medical undergraduate medical training at McGill University in 2008. She went on to complete postgraduate medical training in internal medicine at McGill University and infectious disease and medical microbiology at the University of Ottawa. In 2016, she joined the Regional Microbiology Reference Laboratory at the Eastern Ontario Regional Laboratory Association as a medical microbiologist and is cross-appointed to the Department of Medicine Division of Infectious Disease. Dr. Sands has been heavily involved in the planning, verification, implementation of the total laboratory automation systems in microbiology. Other research interests include applications of molecular typing methods in hospital epidemiology and outbreaks and laboratory stewardship. Dr. Sand is an assistant professor at the University of Ottawa and very involved with undergraduate and postgraduate medical education. She is a program director for the medical microbiology residency program at the University of Ottawa. Her other interests include infection control and epidemiology and antimicrobial -micro stewardship. She acts as a microbiology consultant in these areas at the Ottawa Hospital and client hospitals in the Chaplain LHIN, the Local Health Integration Network region of Ontario, Canada. Without a doubt, Dr. Sands is a motivating figure for us in the MBBS program, aspiring microbiologists, and most certainly in microbiology. An inspiration to many, we are all honored, pleased, and privileged for her to be here with us this evening. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I ask where you are to welcome Dr. Sant. Thank you very much for that lovely, kind introduction. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, my career so far and what it is, what it means to be a medical microbiologist. Um, if you have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to stop or, or uh, just stop me and, and ask along the way, especially if you don't understand um, what I'm talking about, because I'm not really sure in terms of the background how much you have in microbiology. I'm sure it's quite varied. So if you need any clarifications along the way, just let me know. So the objectives for this talk will be to provide an overview of medical microbiology, to discuss the pathways to train in medical microbiology, and then to provide some examples that demonstrate the scope of what we do in our practice, um, uh, as well to show you some of the differences um, in North America and, and just how versatile the, the practice actually is. So just a brief overview of what medical microbiology is. So it's a branch of laboratory and clinical medicine that's concerned primarily with the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of infectious diseases. It consists primarily of five spheres of activity. So that would involve scientific development and administration, as well as clinical direction of a micro lab. Um, it does, we do do clinical consultations, both inpatients and outpatients. And with those consults, we basically diagnose, treat, and prevent infectious diseases. Um, we are heavily involved in infection prevention and control at various hospitals, um, antibiotic, antibiotic, antibiotic stewardship, as well as the epidemiology of communicable diseases. And that can be in the role of a public, in the public health lab or in a tertiary care lab, as well as a community lab. And the roles in these different spheres really will vary depending on the institution that you are employed by. 
Um, so we're going to talk uh, most algae training in Canada, um, and then we'll touch a little bit about what that is in the United States, just to cover most, of, just to cover North America. So um, medical microbiology residency training in Canada is a specialty, um, and basically you would enter after medical school. You enter primarily primarily via the CARMS matching system, um, and I'm sure you've heard about this before in previous lectures that you've had but um, I'll just go over it again briefly. So you must be a Canadian citizen or hold permanent resident status in Canada. Um, you need to be proficient in English um, and or French, depending on the program that you are applying to. Hi, you Dr. To Tan. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, you just need to share your screen. We're not seeing on our end. Oh, sorry oh, about sorry. that. I that it was shared. I'm so sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you. I, no problem. Let me just restart it. Um, let me restart. Can you guys see now? Yes, yeah, seeing everything. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, you need to have the the Medical Council of Canada qualifying exam or the MCCQE part one. You also need to have written the NAC exam. Um, and there are two streams. So there's the Canadian Medical Graduate screen and screen stream and the International Medical Graduate um, st streams. And most provinces um, evaluate these separately and have positions that are designated for for one or both. Um, so basically, if you're a CMG, you can't apply as an IMG and vice versa. And there's designated positions. Um, and it's important to note that various provinces also may have additional eligibility criteria and if you go onto the CARMS website that I've provided at the bottom of the link you will see the various um, differences between the provinces but basically you need to have these main qualifications plus references personal letters um, transcripts etc so if you're a non-Canadian citizen or a non-permanent resident, you still can apply to programs and most universities do have positions available, uh, but you have to apply through the postgraduate um, department through each university specifically and you have to have your own sponsorship support um, to, to, be, to be considered. So this diagram shows you kind of the two main streams to enter medical microbiology in Canada. So the top um, the top portion of this graph, you see that there is a five year medical microbiology residency program, um, after which you would write the medical microbiology licensing exam. Now there's another route and that's kind of unique to to med micro is that you can enter through internal medicine, which is a three year residency program and both of these are entered uh, through comms. And once you complete this three year residency program in internal medicine, you would write your internal medicine licensing exam and then apply through for a fellowship through CARM's um, subspecialty matching once again into an infectious disease residency program, which would be two years of training. Um, and after that, you complete an additional one to two years, um, depending on the program that you enter. And um, you would be required to write both the infectious disease and medical microbiology licensing exam. Now, this is the route that I went um, during my training. Um, and primarily the reason uh, for that was one, I wanted to, to have a good clinical background. I wanted to see patients um, and I wanted, and I trained in Quebec. So really this, this uh, five year, five to seven year program involving internal medicine is mostly done in the Quebec universities uh, because they don't actually have a five year medical microbiology program, but the rest of Canada does. So it is possible to do this, this um, training pathway in other provinces, but it, it really needs some extra funding um, and that need, needs to be secured prior to applying to those programs. So this will show you the positions for microbiology that are offered in Canada during this match, which is currently underway. Um, so there are seven universities that currently have a medical microbiology program, which I'm talking about the five-year program. Um, um, so we have one at the University of Ottawa, U of T has one, McMaster, uh, University of Manitoba, University of Alberta, Calgary, and British Columbia. Now they each have one position only available for a Canadian medical graduate. Um, and then there are two universities that have a spot for an international medical graduate. 
So in total, we have nine physicians um, that are available this year for a medical microbiology training. Uh, so this is a graph kind of showing you um, how it is in, how the number of positions have evolved for microbiology in the last few years. So in 2012, you can see that there was 13 positions that were open. Um, however, if you look in the next column over, you can see that only eight of those positions were filled. And as you move down, you see there was 12 the next year, only six were filled, um, on the only seven in the subsequent years. And then um, you see that the position number of positions that were available kind of drop in 2017. And that's because really in, in the previous years we weren't filling all our quota so they didn't want empty micro em, empty residency positions uh, so they kind of reallocated those um those positions to other specialties so now we're down to you know five to to nine depending on the year um, and we're still not filling those quotas so why is that and you know we think that it's likely due to the lack of knowledge of our program or really that it's just not known that my medical microbiology is a specialty that you can um, enter into. And it's not very well advertised or taught in, um, in medical schools in Canada. So we're working on um, our subspecialty group at the rural college is working on increasing the awareness of that. But this pandemic has definitely helped with increasing um, the awareness that it is a program to be applied to. And we saw that last year with our number of applicants had gone up significantly. If you see down here, there's you know a jump from six to doubled um, the number of applicants that that uh, we had. So hopefully that it'll rate this raise this increase in awareness um, will um, increase the numbers that were available to train in Canada. So it's important to also, if we're talking about medical microbiology, we need to also talk about clinical microbiologists, and um, and these are microbiologists that complete a PhD training first. And then, then they enter into what's called a clinical fellowship program. Um, that's a, an additional two or three years after their PhD. Um, and then they are licensed through the Canadian College of Microbiologists or the American Board of Medical Microbiologists. Um, and that's different than our medical licensing, licensing board, which is the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. So these are not um, MD trained. These are, are or PhD, um, usually in a microbiology specialty or related specialty, um, and then they write, they do two years of two three years in a clinical lab, uh, and then they are able to write these exams. And it's important because they work very closely with a medical microbiologist, and they have similar, if not identical, roles in the medical microbiology lab, except that they don't see patients. Um, so, for example, in my lab, we are equal numbers. There is two medical microbiologists and two clinical microbiologists currently. Um, in our lab. Uh, so it's also important to mention clinical microbiology in that route because in the States, in the United States, it's not a specialty in medical residency. So you can't enter a medical microbiology residency um, after, uh, if, you're, if you're working in the States. Um, you must be certified by the American Board of Medical Microbiology, and you can do that by various routes. So you can, you can obtain an MD, either usually in pathology or infectious diseases, um, and then apply to write the ABBM, ABMM exams, or you can have, be an MD and have three years experience in a microbiology lab, and you're able to write the ABMMs. Um, but the major, the majority of, of microbiologists in the States actually do it via the PhD route, uh, enter a clin micro program and write the exams that way. Uh, so here's the link to the American Board of Medical Microbiology if anybody wants more information um, about uh, writing those exams. So it's important to know also that if you do do your med micro training in Canada, um, you are eligible to write the AB and then exam. So you still would be able to, to practice both in Canada um, and in the States. Um, so I'll just talk briefly about the Med Micro Residency Program here at the University of Ottawa. So here it's a five-year medical residency program. We are currently have three residents, um, but we do have a capacity of five for five for a total of five residents. And we work very closely with the adult and pediatric infectious disease programs. So we share our academic half days, we share journal clubs, we share citywide rounds, case rounds, um, and plate rounds, and they do. Um, the PG, the postgraduate years. So in the first year, it's really a general clinical um, clinical year. So you get exposure to various different 
um, specialties in medicine. So you get pediatrics, internal medicine, hematology, family medicine, respirology, um, as well as some surgical subspecialties um, and infectious diseases. Um, in, this, in years two to four, that's kind of your core years where you learn the bulk of your microbiology, virology, um, infection control and antimicrobial stewardship. There is also um, a lot of involvement with the public health departments um, and health units, um, as well as with the infectious disease consults and clinics. Um, and you also have time for electives, um, depending on what career path you choose. And research is a very important part of the program as well. In your PGY five year, which is your postgraduate year five, um, it's really you're a junior attending. So you're, you're transitioning into your own independent practice. Um, um, so you're, you're basically acting as the staff microbiologist, um, but you do still have support from um, the, the attending microbiologist um, that's also overseeing you. And really you start learning about um, how to actually manage the lab, a lot of the administrative duties that come along with being a medical microbiologist. Um, you're able to do more, more training in infection control and antimicrobial stewardship if you wish to. Um, and again, you can complete any research um, that you have been doing for the past five years. Um, and again, there's more elective time available for career planning. So this is just a uh, just a look at the kind of the jobs that are available currently right now in Canada in medical microbiology. So there is quite a need. Um, and I suspect the pandemic really has um, a lot to do with it um, as well. Um, and uh, this, this is just in Canada, and this is just medical microbiology. So there, um, there, there's virologists and other postings um, as well. Uh, and I didn't put any in from the, from the states, but there is quite a number um, in the states as well. So I'm just going to stop quickly. If anybody has any questions about the different training pathways for micro, um, if not, we'll go on to some cases to give you guys an idea about what we do um, and what it means to be a microbiologist. Okay, so what do we actually do? So I work for uh, ERLA, which is the Eastern Ontario Regional Laboratory Association, and we deliver a regional laboratory service to um, 18 acute care hospitals in the champlain lynn region of Southern Ontario. Um, and basically, we had a lab that was located pretty much in, in every hospital that was microbiology. But in 2013, there was a decision to make, uh, that was made to consolidate microbiology into one lab that was located um, uh, at the at the Ottawa Hospital. So, uh, if, if microbiology was to consolidate, we would serve a total of three thousand beds. Um, we need to accommodate a projected increase of forty six percent in specimen volume, uh, but we needed to do this in the same space uh, or the same um, with the same staff or even less staff, depending on when samples came in in the evenings um, or on the weekends. So that would mean we have to process about three hundred and fifty to 400,000 specimens a year um, in bacteriology, mycology, bacteriology, or virology. Uh, so we needed to come up with a solution um, for this. And basically coming up with this solution and implementing it really, um, really applies you know, all, feel, all spheres of, of what we do. So that's why I chose to go over this example. Um, so our solution to that problem was actually implementing total lab automation in the lab. Uh, so what, so to know why total lab automation would really help us in the lab, you really need to know what a microbiology looked like before TLA. Uh, so, so when a sample comes to the lab, we do direct staining, which is this picture on the top here, which is the most common stain that we do is a gram stain. Um, and then you would plate the sample onto a some kind of nutrient agar, um, incubate the specimen, and then read the specimen at 24, 48, 72 hours, depending on the, the specimen that, you, that you're incubating. Um, so the important thing to note here is that all of this is done manually and it's done by, by technologists. There's very limited automation that um, in previous years that's, that's been incorporated into microbiology. So it's relatively new um, innovation for micro, uh, but it really would help that it, to automate a lot of these um, processes uh, because it would require less staff and it would require less space. You can see the lab looks quite cluttered on the, the picture on the right. So um, to choose a total lab automation system, there's a process that you have to follow uh, in Canada. So it's not just you choose the one that you like, um, you basically have to follow by law uh, a process. And so you have to ask for information from various providers or vendors um, and see what's out there. 
So when we did that, we saw that there was three system that three systems that needed our needs. There was a BD Keystra TLA, the Copan Wasp, and the I2A Prelude and Recital. Um, so once we knew that those were the three ones that would meet our our process, we went through um, uh, basically a what we call an RFP or a ref, um, request for products, um, and we basically contact these vendors, come up with criteria um, that we would grade each of these systems on, grade them, rate them, and then the one that meets the, the our, our criteria kind of to the, 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 the best would win the contract basically. And that was the BD Keystra TLA. So that's the one that we're gonna talk about. Um, and we're gonna talk about how we implement the BD Keystra. So this is the BD Keystra TLA kind of in a nutshell. Um, it's quite a big machine, um, as you can see. And uh, it's, it's basically automating every, every most aspects of microbiology. So this picture at the bottom here, the, oops, um, where it says inocula is basically where we load all our samples and it's totally automated. You just put the sample onto the system um, and you walk away and the system will take plates uh, from the sortira um, and inoculate the plates, uh, transfer them to these Rita compacts at the back, um, which are our smart incubators. Um, and after a certain predetermined incubation time, they would take pictures of the plates and display them on these ergonomica stations you can see in the top picture there. Um, the interesting thing about the, the, the keystra is that you, uh, the streaking involves a bead so you get a very you get very intricate um, streaking and you get very um, well isolated colonies, which is important in microbiology. It saves time. So how do we install this giant machine in our lab? So if you, the top left picture, you see that's what our lab looked like um, before that we we decided to do uh, implement TLA. Um, so we had to you know we had to to consult with. We had to consult with uh, engineers, with architects, with um, in, uh, information technology specialists, and we had to have a lot of different teams and a lot of stakeholders involved in doing this. Um, so the main, the, the biggest challenge for the lab really was the construction aspect of it, where we had to basically gut the center of the lab um, and tear it apart, reinforce the floors to make sure the floor doesn't buckle under the immense weight of this machine. And we had to do all of this still while maintaining all services to the hospitals that we provided uh, services for. So you can see here that um, in the picture in the bottom, the center of the lab was basically gutted, but behind these hoarding walls um, is basically where we did all the microbiology for a full year. Um, and then the, the picture in the on the bottom Right, you can see the lab has been emptied in the center and the small area in the back and along the sides where we really had to do all of our, our microbiology. So it was quite a challenge to do that. And this was kind of the final product. Um, so now that we have it install, installed, what do we do with it? Um, is it basically a $3 million paperweight or does it actually work? So the next um, step really is verification uh, of the machine. So basically making sure that it does what it's supposed to do um, without, inter without um, compromising our patient samples or changing how we would report things. So we did that by doing first the basic verification of the incubation conditions, making sure it actually inoculates the plates um, and the software was working. Uh, and then we made sure that the didn't um, impact any of the growth or how we identified organisms. And we actually had to switch e swabs. And so a lot of things that people outside of lab medicine don't appreciate is that you can't just you know implement new machines and make sure that they work or implement new swabs and make sure uh, and, and assume that they're going to work. You really have to go through a pretty rigorous um, verification and validation process uh, to be able to implement these things. Um, so, and then you have to do, once you verify the system, you have to validate it and make sure that um, it doesn't alter how you report. And uh, we did this by doing parallel evaluations. So basically manually doing um, how we would normally work up, for example, a urine specimen, and then working up that same urine specimen on the Keystra. And we did this for all of our sample types. Um, but we're going to do, we're just going to talk about urine because it kind of illustrates all the issues that could have come up. So when we implement machines, the, it's important to think about how it would impact 
or how you think it's going to impact um, your results or your workup of, of various specimens. So can anybody tell me if they can foresee any difficulties or any problems with using a 10 microliter inoculation volume versus a one microliter? So the Keystra uses 10 microliters and traditionally we used one microliter and this is specific for urines. Can anybody tell me any concerns you may have with doing that? No, I can't see anybody, so I don't know, but no one is um, going to talk, so that's okay. I will keep going. So basically, we had a number of concerns. So as, as you know, a urine culture is a quantitative uh, culture, um, so we really need to be able to accurately give you guys a, a, a quantitative growth report. Um, and with 10 microliters, it's going to be hard to count all those colonies. With one microliter, we can count up to about 100 colonies, um, which would be clinically significant. But if you make that 1,000 colonies, it's going to be pretty much impossible for us to count those on a plate. And I'll show you pictures to, to illustrate that later. Also, a higher volume will increase the likelihood of isolating or reporting contaminants, and the overgrowth of these contaminants may complicate and interpret the effect of positivity rates. So you may miss something that's buried, or you may overreport a mixed culture. Um, so those are kind of the, the things we wanted to address when you um, write a validation protocol for this. So uh, this is um, just to further illustrate my con our concerns we had with how we would quantitate urine cultures after increasing the volume. Um, so clinically, a clinically significant urine count in the urine um, is 10 to the 5 CFU per milliliter or uh, greater than 100 times 10 to the 6 CFUs per liter. So that would be clinically significant. So it's important for us to be able to determine that the, the difference between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 organisms um, from a urine culture. So would we be able to do this with 10 microliters? Because if you look at this chart, if you plant one microliter of, of a 10 to the four solution, you'd expect 10 colonies. If you plant one microliter of 10 to the five, you would expect 100 colonies. If you do 10 microliters of a 10 to the five concentration, you would expect 1,000 colonies on your plate. So really, as I said, you can only count up to 100 colonies. So how do we differentiate between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 if we can't count in between these two numbers? So what are we going to be reporting there? So to do that, basically, we wanted to see if we could come up with a method to be able to do that, um, and then see if that method really would affect how we would report our urine cultures. So what we did was we took um, multiple dilutions of um, various organisms that were common, um, that we commonly isolate in urine cultures, uh, and we planted them with 10 microliters and one microliter, and we did this 10 times per dilution, and then we looked and see basically what we got. So this is what an example of what the plates look like. So if you can see here at 10 to the 3 initial organism concentration, you can see that um, with 10 microliters, you can easily count the number of colonies there. But as you get up to 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5, it's getting more difficult to count these colonies um, in, in a decent amount of time, right? With 10 to the 4, you could probably count them, but it would take you a, a long time to count each of these colonies. Um, but you wouldn't be able to count uh, the colonies at higher, at higher concentrations because you start not even being able to see distinct colonies at, um, at these higher concentrations. And when you can't see distinct colonies, we call that confluent growth. Um, so we can tell the difference like visually between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5. Um, but again, it's very difficult for us to be able to actually count those numbers. So this, this chart just basically shows you um, the colony counts and the standard deviation that we got for each of the organisms. Uh, and from that data, um, you can see that the, how we differentiate between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 is that you see that there's confluent growth um, between the two. So how we would differentiate them is uh, if there was confluent growth, we would say that there was 10 to the 5 organisms there. If there was no confluent growth, then there was 
10 to the 4 or less. Uh, and from these numbers here, we, can, we came up with this reporting table. Um, and we saw that we could get a range of, organi a range of numbers. Um, it doesn't necessarily, own, you know, we don't get that 100 or that 1, you get a range. So here you see that um, we've incorporated the ranges into our table here. So we, using that data, we filled in our, our chart here. So if we um, had 10 to the 4 organisms in the initial concentration, we'd expect that um, you get, you'd see greater than 100, but no confluent growth. Um, and then because we couldn't count the exact number between uh, 100 and 1,000, um, we had to take an average. And we consulted with um, various stakeholders, so infectious diseases, nephrology, people that you would use urine cultures, uh, and, and that this would potentially impact. Um, and they said, yes, no, this is very, this is okay to use. And the other option was that we would be able, we could have given them a range. Um, so what we actually saw, 10, uh, 1 to 9 or 10 to 99, uh, but they decided, we, and, and we decided as a group that no, that that would probably could be more confusing rather than helpful. Um, so we actually stuck with the uh, reporting average. So this is our, our current table for, um, that we use when reporting urines. So this is just to show you an example of what a plate, a typical plate would look like. So you can see here that there's two organisms and one is more growth than other than the other organism. So the Pseudomonas is this darker gray colony here. And you can see that there is greater than 100 colonies and there's confluent growth down here. You can't see individual colonies as you get into the, the primary inoculum. Um, the lighter, whiter colony on top is a serratia, um, and you can see that there's greater than 100 colonies, but there isn't confluent growth. So this is how, at the bottom here, how that would be reported um, in our cultures. So now that we have a way of reporting, um, does that actually work clinically, and does it, is it a difference between, um, like, would we report it differently using 10 microliters versus one microliter, and would that have a clinical impact? So we looked at, um, we actually did a parallel evaluation again with 625 urine clinical patient specimens. Um, and we plated them with the Keystra as well as the manual method. Um, and then we looked at the results. So the results between the two were categorized into these three categories. So whether there was exact agreement, whether there was clinical agreement, meaning that they may have differed a little bit in the report, but the clinical impact would have been the same, or whether there were very just discrepant results. Um, and as you can see that the, there was a 96% um, clinical and exact agreement. So basically there was only a 4% um, number of specimens that there may have been a difference between a one microliter and a 10 microliter inoculum. And if you actually look at what those were, there was an additional 1.6% that a pathogen was identified by a keystrap, but not by the manual. But the keystrap could have potentially missed a pathogen in 2.4%. Uh, but if you looked at each of those 15 specimens, really those organisms that we had identified were most likely contaminants uh, to begin with. So they were organisms like coagulant negative staph or Bearden's group strap, which are not usually um, pathogens in the urine. So really there wasn't any clinical impact um, using the method that we derived. So just to, just to give you, this is just the conclusion, but really it was to give you guys an example of the work that goes into validating and verifying new tests or changes um, as things happen in microbiology. And it's a really rapid field that's advancing, especially with all the molecular testing that's coming out um, and all the automation um, that's been new. So it's a, it's a significant part of what we do. Um, and validating these things gives us, you know, we can identify various limitations. Um, we can uh, you know, liaise with a lot of different, um, different groups as well. So that's basically what we do in terms of validating tests. Um, so what do we do on a day-to-day -day basis? So really day-to-day, -day, we do laboratory management, we do quality assurance, and a lot of that is administrative work um, in terms of, uh, in the form of management meetings, quality meetings, um, or following quality indicators. We also oversee the micro workup of all the clinical specimens. So we update and write protocols. Uh, we do rounds in the lab on each of the benches to see if uh, the lab technologists have questions about various uh, specimens or workup of the specimens. We also have a lot of case discussions with physicians, um, 
specifically mostly infectious diseases, but various other physicians as well. We do do lab stewardship in the sense that some tests require um, approval from a microbiologist. So if we don't think a test is indicated, we generally talk to the physicians and ask, you know, why are, why are you asking for this test? Maybe this test might be a better in this clinical scenario. And we, we have discussions um, to try to improve lab utilization. Uh, we also sit on a number of committee members, uh, members, so we do antimicrobial stewardship. And in that role, we also create site-specific antibiograms um, for each of the hospitals. Uh, we sit on the infection prevention and control committees. But depending on where you are, uh, you could be the IPAC lead um, if you're in you know, smaller rural hospitals. And, and for me specifically, I do clinical ID consults, but um, that's because I'm also trained in infectious diseases. But uh, PureMed MicroTrain, which is the five-year program, can also do clinical consultations, um, but they usually, um, where I usually do that where infectious diseases specialists aren't available or um, like in rural communities, for example. So this is just to give you guys an overview of, of the specimen, kind of the path of the specimen through the lab. Um, and I'm gonna go through some examples, uh, well, actually just one example, just for time sake um, of, you know, a typical specimen that we work through or something that was a little bit, a um, little bit different. Oops. So, Micro is a little bit different um, in the sense that we don't usually start with a case description. So we don't usually start with the, you know, the usual 80 year old patient with this past medical history on these medication with these allergies, and this is the history of presenting illness. We usually start with this requisition and whatever we see on a requisition like this is basically all the clinical information that we start with. Um, so this one, we know that it is a 61 year old male that has a consolidation on a CT of his chest He's on Piptazo in terms of antibiotics, um, and they want routine bacteriology culture on a tracheal aspirate. Really, there's no additional information that's there. So this is all we have to go with in working up a, a, a specimen. So the first thing that we do with, this, with our, a sputum, um, if you look at our, our previous algorithm there, is that we do a gram stain. So this is what the gram stain looks like. Um, does anybody care to take a chance to read? The gram stain. Okay, I'll read it for you guys. So you see that there's some polymorphic nuclear cells there in the background. Um, there is some gram positive cocci and there's some gram positive bacilli, but nothing too um, alarming. The gram positive bacilli um, don't look like elongated gram positive cocci, so we're not really worried about strep pneumo in this case. So this is the growth after 24 hours or 18 to 24 hours of incubation. Um, and really this is read as normal flora. But there is something else strange that was on the plate. Does anybody know what looks kind of strange on these plates? Why did the microbiologist that looked at this be like, hmm, maybe I should call infectious diseases? So that's what we did. So we called the, the infectious disease and we asked for more information because we really didn't have any more information. We wanted to know what else to do with this specimen. So when we talked to them, we got that this patient was originally from Uganda. They immigrated many years ago. They were last there in 2010. Um, and uh, they have this month history of progressive decline, weight loss, diarrhea. And then they presented rapidly declining with uh, respiratory failure that needed ICU admission. Um, he had an eosinophilia and a colitis on CT with some free air, but no obvious perforation. Um, so knowing this history, and with discussion with infectious diseases, there was something specific that we were worried about. So we went back and we actually looked at his gram stain, which I showed previously under a higher power. So when we usually look at microscopic, on, under the microscope in micro, we look at a hundred times. It's not like PATH or, or others where they look at, at, at lower magnification. We look at quite high magnification and we barely ever look at 10, time, like, uh, 10 times. So this is a picture of the same sputum, um, but at 10 times magnification. And you can see that there's definitely something abnormal that's there. Does anybody know what that is? So that's, uh, that's actually strongyloides, and this patient had um, strongyloides hyperinfection. So the, the case really I just wanted to get to show you to illustrate that uh, micro is not always that straightforward. We always have these interesting cases, and it's 
um, it's a, a lot of discussion with uh, with physicians and it is still very clinical what we do it's not just um, you know putting specimens on a machine and letting it uh, do its thing so I'm going to give you an example if I have time um, about our IPAC role and it'll, it'll also give you an introduction into the molecular diagnostics that we use um, in the lab. So I'm going to talk specifically about an MRSA outbreak we had in, in our NICU, which is the neonatal intensive care unit. So we had um, in early November that there was this um, outbreak um, that was declared because of a tracheal aspirate that was positive for MRSA. So this declaration of uh, an outbreak prompted admission and discharge screening. And on this, this new screening, we found two more patients that were identified as MRSA positive, but had previously done um, PCRs on these patients that were negative. So we didn't really understand why that was happening, but uh, we did do further investigations after that, and we identified an additional five patients that were negative by MRSA PCR, but ended up being positive by MRSA culture. So we had two questions that were asked of us by infection control. So are the strains related? Is this really an outbreak? Um, um, and uh, basically, why is the PCR negative? So in terms of looking at relatedness of strains, it's really strain typing. Um, and we could send it to our public health lab to do pulse field, which is kind of the gold standard um, of molecular typing. Um, but usually, this takes quite a long time. And given that it's a, a, a NICU, uh, really, we wanted to do this quite fast, like within you know a couple hours or, or a day or two. Uh, so if you look at the literature, there is a number of PCR-based methods um, that can be applied to typing. And specifically, if you look at step four, is, um, we, we can use in the lab what we call a variable number of tandem repeat analysis. Um, or you look at multiple, lo multiple locuses in the MLVF method. Uh, so that's kind of what we did um so just a quick summer just a quick overview that the vntr or ml vntr um, is a molecular typing method that involves pcr analysis of repetitive elements um, so you, there are studies in literature that establish which primer sets work best for which species so you basically um, do a review of the literature look at these primers um, obtain the primers or synthesize them and then you can you can basically type um, in your lab. So uh, using this method, you have different size fragments that are generated. Depending on the number of genes that you look at and depending on the location of the repeats, you'll get these different sizes. Um, and then you would do, you separate the, the amplification products by a gel electrophoresis and you compare the fingerprints that you get. So these are the primers um, that we use and we looked at five genes. Um, in, in Staph aureus. So once you do the PCR, you get this, um, this is the, the, uh, the gel electrophoresis um, of the various amplification products. And you can see that sample, that our patient samples one through seven are actually identical. And we compared them to various um, uh, epidemiological uh, MRSA strains. Um, and they really didn't seem to, to, to look like um, any of them. But if you look at the same data, but you input it into a dendogram, which is you can get a program that can create these for you, um, you see that uh, all of the outbreak isolates are identical, and they look like they're clo mo clo most closely related to CMRSA5. Um, so, and then we did more subsequent screening, screening which was done by culture, not uh, PCR, because the PCR was negative. And we actually found a total of 19 NICU patients that were positive and five healthcare workers. And this is the gel that we showed uh, using the same method as before. And you can see that all the clinical isolates um, are the same, except for these two patients here, which actually ended up being twins and most likely acquired it from um, their mother. But the other um, isolates were all identical and likely part of the outbreak. So again, this is just the dendogram that shows that there is uh, you know, 17 out of the 19 um, outbreak isolates were identical. Um, and three out of the five healthcare workers were also identical to the outbreak, um, outbreak strain. So this really helps um, the you know, IPAC in terms of contact tracing and 
uh, you know, management of, um, of that outbreak. So this is the result that we got back from public health and really it gave the exact same results that we were able to obtain in days um, rather, than, and rather than weeks. So why, this is just saying what I just said. So why was the PCR negative? Um, and a lot of what we do in micro is sleuthing. Like we look and see why things are, are, are you know, changing or why they, um, they're, they're not what we expect. Um, and it also shows us the limitations of the various tests that we have, especially molecular tests. Um, so the PCR that we use for MRSA targets a sequence that covers the right junction of the SCC MEC element um, that's, uh, that's adjacent to the chromosomal region encoding the um, species-specific open um, reading frame. So, uh, and it, it detects uh, SCC MEC types one to five. Um, so there is a forward and reverse primer, and the forward primer targets a region with a relatively high sequence homology. However, the reverse primer, it tends to be, the region tends to be a little more variable, and that's where we kind of hypothesize where the problem was happening. Um, so the next step really to see if that was the case was to sequence um, our strain. So we started by sequencing the SCC MEC, uh, and as you can see here, that there are um, various strains that we compared it to, but you start seeing the differences towards that, that more variable region that I mentioned. Um, and you can see here is the forward primer, uh, and then here is the reverse primer. And you see that if this, this, this line here is our, our outbreak strain, you can see that there is a lot of difference between um, the reverse primer and our sequence. So that's why there, it wasn't working. So that actually changed how we do a lot of things in the NICU um, is that we, we do it by culture rather than PCR as we do for the rest of the hospital. So investigating these things really leads to a lot of changes in the lab. In the lab. Um, and with that, I don't wanna go over time. So um, if anybody had any questions, um, I'd be happy to take them and I, Sincerely apologize for the technical difficulties multiple that I had during this presentation, but I still hope you guys were able to take away some good information. That's okay, pertaining to the um, technical difficulties. So in the meantime, if you can um, share any of your questions, anyone, feel free to type it in the chat or you can turn on your mic. We do have a few questions that were sent in before. Um, can you tell us personally why you chose um, to go into microbiology? Yes, definitely. Um, so I have always been interested in biology and um, microbiology. So I come from a very scientific, we back like scientific background family. So my dad's a physicist, my mom's a nurse, my um, uncle was a doctor, so I was really, um, you know, introduced to this field at a, at a very young age. Um, and when I was very young, uh, I had this book called The Value of Believing in Yourself, a story of Louis Pasteur. So from then on, I just kept reading about micro um, and, you know, I really had an interest in it. And I did my, you know, I had all my research starting in undergrad was in it. And I really knew that I would, wanted to go into microbiology or infectious diseases. So the, the pathway I chose was medicine where you can choose the, the PhD route um, as well. But I chose the MD route because I really wanted to, to do the infectious disease portion part of it. And I wanted to, to you know, be comfortable doing that. So I, I went the MD route. Okay. Um, there is a question in the chat. I see Farah, she says, is it very difficult or is the competition high for IMG to get through to Canada to do the medical microbiology program? So we do, uh, we currently have an IMG uh, graduate uh, or trainee in our program now. So th th it is possible to, to get positions, but as I mentioned, the number of positions have been decreasing. Um, just because of the, the, the lack of interest or the lack of applicants. If the number of applicants go up, the number of positions are gonna go up. So right now I would say it's probably a little more competitive just because there are only two options, uh, two positions available um, right now, but that will likely change in the next, uh, next few, um, probably the next few years. But what, as an IMG, what I, what I do suggest that you do is contact programs that offer IMG positions prior to CARMS. 
um, you know, ask to come for an elective or come to visit, talk to them, get to know the lab so they know who you are. It's always a bit better to, to do it that, that way um, and rather than having your first time meeting them um, during, during the interview process. Okay, we also have another question. Um, so do you think in the future microbiology would be overtaken by technology? Where can persons play a role in the years to come with the introduction of advanced technologies? Yeah, so I, I, I think my examples kind of maybe illustrate where we are still needed. So, you know, there is a lot of limitations to these molecular tests. Um, a lot of people look at them as, you know, magic, the holy grail of, you know, diagnos diagnostics now. But really, there's there's still a lot of limitations um, to molecular tests, and I won't get into to all of them. Um, uh, and and I, I talk specifically about molecular testing because um, that's kind of the easier thing to automate. Um, and to be replaced by. But you still need someone to interpret it. You still need someone to develop these tests. You still need someone to, to validate these tests. Um, changing platforms uh, are, co are constantly happening. Um, and I didn't, you know, it's hard to have a microbiology talk without talking about COVID and the current pandemic. But I tried to do that just because I wanted to give you guys a break from that. But really, um, you know, you can't replace, you know, pandemic response um, without having the, the specialists that are there. And this won't be our last pandemic. You know, this is, this is going to be unfortunately more common. There's a lot of emerging diseases um, out there. So definitely we'll, we will not be replaced. And you can never replace interpretate, interpreting a, a, um, a culture. Right, and then that was illustrated kind of with uh, that strongyloides hyperinfection. Right, you need you need the clinical expertise to be able to go back and say, no, something strange here. There's there is something there, and we need to look at it a little bit closer. And one last question that was sent in from before, and just a reminder, everyone can still send in your questions. We do have a bit of time, um, so the question says, and it's very interesting. Um, what are the character traits of someone who would excel in the field of microbiology? <laughs> so, you, someone, um, I guess, uh, in micro, you you need to have great communication skills. So there's a lot of um, interaction with different types of position. So you are consulting with senior management in the hospital, you're consulting with nurses who call you, you're consulting with um, other physicians that call you, you're consulting with lab managers, um, really who have no scientific background. So there's uh, a lot of manag managerial skills that are required to be uh, to be a microbiologist and, and run a lab, um, which you don't necessarily get any training or any, you know, um, you know, any uh, introduction to or involvement in during your medical training. So that was kind of the steepest learning curve here. But anybody who excels with any kind of managerial skills or uh, communication skills really is, is kind of what you need. I mean, that's on top of what you need to become a physician, but yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So I believe that's the end of our question. Oh, okay, so we have one more. Uh, Farah says, I am in third year MBBS. However, I hold an MSc in infectious disease from LSHTM. Do you think that would um, be favorable for choosing uh, as a candidate? So, so yeah, definitely any any infectious disease background or further training in micro and infectious diseases will definitely give you um, an advantage um, above um, other candidates who don't have that that training and that interest. Um, and it will really uh, give you a head start in terms of learning um, learning microbiology and, and and integrating into the lab. Okay, thank you everyone for your questions. So we did a live feedback and I would like to share the screen to let you know what everyone has thought of the session. So persons found it enlightening, very interesting, um, well presented, eye opening, informative, um, excellent, lovely. So this is all feedback from persons who were in the session. So we would like to thank you so much um, for leaving such an impact on the on these individuals. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. <laughs> 
that's okay. <laughs> it's all good. It happens um, in the virtual world and in the real world in person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just to close off, um, I truly hope you all had a wonderful and learning experience. At this time, um, we would have sent out the feedback form. So you can look out for that in the chat and take a minute to fill that out. It will be greatly appreciated for documentation and improvement of our future events. So um, Maya Angelou alluded to the fact that you cannot achieve success without helping others to become successful. And I think that's very pertinent to this session here today. So firstly, I would like to thank you again, Dr. Sant, who despite your busy schedule, graced us this evening with an amazing and enlightening presentation where we were all extremely grateful to learn about microbiology. Thank you for an insight behind the scenes of microbiologists and a reminder of the importance of microbiology, its automation systems, um, the role that humans play in microbiology, and especially thank you for making it interactive. <laughs> well, at least attempting to make it interactive. <laughs> Last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for accompanying us tonight. Thank you for making our event a success, and we look forward for your continued support. To all our UE students and staff across three campuses at the University of the Ottawa and the Eastern Ontario Laboratory Regional Association, and especially to our specially invited guests, thank you, thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this ends the mark of our session this evening. Thank you all for joining us for our 13th installment of CPAMSI and we hope to see you at our future events. Take care and be safe everyone. Come